Okay, we wrapped up chapter um, seven last time. That was convection heat transfer. Outside of tubes are flat plates called external flow. This is this, uh, chapter eight we start today. Convection heat transfer, how do we handle internal flows? All right, let's look first of all. I'll go back and uh, put on chapter seven. Just a quick look at that. So chapter seven uh, had flow over a flat plate, maybe laminar and turbulent called mixed flow, maybe. We measured X in that direction. Then we had flow over a cylinder. This was U infinity. Uh, flow over a cylinder, the flow approached the cylinder with a velocity, U infinity. And this was a tube of diameter D. These were external flow. This was chapter seven. This was a tube, flow over a tube, normal to the axis. This is flow chapter eight inside of a tube. So now we kind of shift gears. Chapter seven, we had flow over the outside of a tube. Chapter eight, we have flow on the inside of a tube. Same thing with chapter seven. Before you do the heat transfer, you have to understand a lot of the fluid mechanics. Okay, there's some magic Reynolds number. This is 500,000, the transition from laminar to turbulent, five times 10 to the fifth. 500,000. This Reynolds number was based on the distance x, u infinity x over nu. This Reynolds number was based on the tube diameter. If we have flow inside a tube, revisiting ME311, we uh, have the Reynolds number um times the diameter over nu. um is called the mean fluid velocity. Of course, in the real world, this D and that D are not the same thing. This is the outside diameter of a tube, and that's the inside diameter of the tube. But we won't worry about that now as long as you know that chapter 8, it's the ID. Chapter 7, it's the OD of the tube. If somebody says the mean velocity, if somebody says the velocity of the fluid in the tube is 10 feet per second, and let's say it's laminar flow, there's the velocity profile. It's parabolic for laminar flow in a tube. And if somebody says the velocity in the tube is 10 feet per second, well, they sure don't mean the center line velocity is 10 feet per second. They don't mean the velocity at the tube surface is 10 feet per second, zero, no slip condition. Well, what, what do they mean? They mean that this would be 10 right there. So that's the mean fluid velocity. Do you just average it, a uh, 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 10 plus zero divided by uh, whatever, two? No, no. For instance, if this velocity on the center line If that centering velocity is 12 feet per second, is the mean fluid velocity 12 divided by two? Uh-uh, no, no, uh-uh, no. It, because the cross section looks like a circle. And there's a lot more area out here than there is in the middle. So it's called a weighted average. It, it, it's a weighted average. 
you just, you just don't take the center line velocity. It's not like this. Well, I'm not even going to draw it, okay? Go back to math. What's the average value of y from 0 to 2? Oh, it's 5. 10 divided by 2. It's 5. I guarantee it's 5. No, it won't work here. It won't work here. This is not a linear profile, and it's not a one-dimensional profile. Okay, so anyway, that's what the word mean is. That's why they don't use the word average. It, sometimes that confuses people. They think average, oh, take this divided by that, and that's the average, half of that value. No, that's not the average. And, and you did that in ME311, so I'm not going to revisit that. Okay, anyway, so here's what happens. We assume we've got the tube. There's an approaching fluid stream whose velocity is um, the subscript i means inlet. So i means inlet. m means mean. So this is the mean velocity at the inlet. When it hits the tube at x equals zero, a boundary layer starts to build up around the perimeter of the tube, a boundary layer. That boundary layer develops from all around the perimeter, all around the perimeter, it develops. When the boundary layers meet at the center line, that's a special region called the entrance region. That's where the entrance region ends, and that distance is x fully developed. x f d is the fully developed distance let's just assume it's laminar let's talk about um, In a tube, ME311, if the Reynolds number is less than 2300, we're going to assume it's laminar flow. Different textbooks sometimes use different numbers. One textbook uses 2100. Our textbook uses 2300. There's no one universally accepted value. So our book uses 2300. So for this class, we'll use 2300. If it's greater than that, of course, it's turbulent. Okay, so for right now, we'll just assume laminar flow, make it easy on ourselves. If it's laminar flow in a tube, we know from fluid mechanics that the velocity profile is parabolic. Parabolic. Fully developed means if I go down a ways and look at it again, it's the same shape parabola. It didn't change. This is the velocity u as a function of r. The profiles don't change. That's why that's called the fully developed region. Okay. The distance it takes to become fully developed for laminar flow 0.05 Reynolds D. If it's turbulent flow, the book says we're going to use 10. It's typically accepted between somewhere from 10 to 60. That, that's how you'd find X fully developed. Our textbook says to be conservative, we'll say 10. 
Okay, so that's the two equations you use to find this distance, XFD. So how do you find XFD? Okay, fluid mechanics, there they are. Now, mm, let's say the Reynolds number is uh, 2,000. So I'll say it's laminar flow. X fully developed equal um, the uh, 0 0.05 times the diameter times the Reynolds number based on D. Let's see what I assumed here for a diameter. Okay, I said let's let it be a one inch diameter tube. If D is one inch, then X fully developed from this equation right here, X fully developed is 100 inches, which is on the order of 8 feet. So here's 1 inch from there to there. That's a little more than 1 inch. Okay. There's 1 inch tube. And those boundary layers build up from the entrance is over there. Where do these two dashed lines meet the center line of the one inch tube? Oh boy. Three, six, seven, eight. Right here. So it would take that flow this long a distance before finally the boundary layers meet at the center line of the tube. Oh, it's a long, long way. A long, long way. Should we engineers be worried about what happens in the entrance region of a tube? Oh, you better. Because, you know, a one inch tube with a Reynolds number of 2,000 has to be eight foot long before you get out of the entrance region. Before you get out of the entrance region and into the fully developed region. So, oh yeah. Take turbulent flow. Take a Reynolds number based on D. I think I took 20,000. 2 times 10 to the fourth. X is X fully developed. D times 10. Uh, What's D one inch? A one inch tube. Ten inches. Wow. Wow, for turbulent flow, those profiles develop very fast and meet at the center line very, very short distance. Ten inches compared to laminar flow, a hundred inches long. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's a big difference in laminar and turbulent flow. Where do you worry about that? Oh, I'll just give you one idea. Your automotive radiator. Is there tubes in that thing? Oh, of course there is. They're vertical. What do they carry? Yeah, hot water. How do you cool them? Blow air over them with fins. Is the flow in those tubes laminar or turbulent? Oh, I suspect it's turbulent, you know. It's hard to get laminar flow in anything. I, I'm, I'm, I'm at a real good intuitive guess, an engineering intuitive guess. It's turbulent. Okay. Um, what's those diameters of those tubes? I don't know. Maybe uh, that big, maybe a quarter inch, three-eighths of an inch. I don't know. Ten times a quarter inch, two and a half inches. Oh, they develop pretty quick, don't they? The flow that comes in the, the tubes in the radiator develop pretty quick, I think, to fully develop because you might have 12 inches or 14 inches of the radiator height, and, and they develop in two and, two, two and a half inches maybe. So anyway, that's the kind of decisions you've got to make to see what's going on in your automotive radiator or your trans oil cooler or your oil, oil cooler. How quick does the, do the boundary layers build up to where you have fully developed flow? Or is most of your tube 
in the entrance region. If this is laminar flow and my tube is two feet long, chop it off here, it's all in the entrance region. It's all in the entrance region. There is no fully developed for a tube that long. One inch tube, two feet in length, no. It's all in laminar flow. It's all going to be in the developing region. So that's why it's important to know what's going on in these regions. This is a fluid mechanics case. Now we do the temperature. Same kind of picture. Here's the tube. Diameter D. Okay. But now we're looking at the thermal situation, which is what's approaching the fluid or the tube. The fluid is at a temperature T mean in. Let's go back to chapter seven one more time. What's approaching the flap plate? U infinity. What's coming into the tube? Don't say U infinity. There's no such thing as a free stream temperature in a tube. UMI. Flat plate, external flow over a tube. What's the approaching temperature? T infinity, the free stream temperature. There is no free stream temperature in a tube. We call it the inlet temperature of the tube. Yeah, TMI, inlet temperature of the tube. When that profile hits the tube, a boundary layer starts to develop, a temperature boundary layer. And eventually, that boundary layer meets at the center line. The distance from the tube entrance to the center line is called X fully developed. Sometimes they put T on there for temperature. If there's no subscript, they mean velocity. And this is the entrance region. And this is the fully developed region. Okay, now there's different conditions with the temperature. Let, let's draw a profile here where the tube surface temperature is constant. This is TS tube surface temperature. And we'll call that constant. Let's say the fluid that comes in is cooler, a colder fluid. You're heating the fluid. So here's the temperature profile. Looks like that. You go down a ways. The tube surface temperature is a constant. Constant, constant. Go down a ways. Constant, constant, constant. TS here. TS here, constant, constant, constant. The fluid in the tube starts to get hotter. You're heating it, comes in cold. Tube surface temperature hot. You're heating the fluid. This is how it looks. Go down a ways further. This is how it looks. Oh, you can see how it's changing. It's getting flatter and flatter across the middle. All the, all the fluid in there is approaching the tube surface temperature, TS. All the fluid temperature is approaching TS. If you go down far enough, that's the fully developed region for temperature. Here's the fully developed region for velocity. Okay, okay, here we go again. How do we find this X fully developed temperature? Okay, X fully developed temperature for laminar flow. For turbulent flow, same as velocity, 10, 10 diameters. Turbulent flow is so mixed up that it doesn't change between 
these two pictures, but laminar flow, or, but uh, the um, exfoliate developed laminar flow does vary. All you do is you tag on a panel number after the Reynolds number here. We did that in chapter seven. A lot of our equations, chapter seven, had the panel number tagged on to the right-hand side of the equation. It's characteristic of, uh, of uh, thermal analysis. Okay, and let's box these guys in. All right, so now we have that. There's several objectives of looking at a tube like this. Um, number one is you'd like to find the temperature at any distance along the tube, obviously. Find the temperature of the fluid anywhere down the tube. Um, number two, you want to find the heat transfer. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that's heat transfer, ME415, find the heat transfer. And uh, you probably want to find H, because H is important, convection heat transfer coefficient. So probably three things you want to look at. How do I find the temperature as a function of X? Okay. How do I find the heat that's been transferred to the fluid from the tube? And then how do I find the convection coefficient H? Okay. All right, now, um, this is constant tube surface temperature. I'm gonna start over here now. There's different kinds of boundary conditions on the tube surface. Number one is you can have constant tube surface temperature. Number two is you can have constant surface heat flux. So this will be constant surface heat flux. QS double prime. Double prime means watts per square meter. S means on the surface. Okay, so in this particular tube case, you have a constant QS double prime. In that case, you have a constant surface temperature. So that picture I'll put over here looks like this. No matter what the X value is, it's the same surface temperature. This is, these are the two cases that our textbook looks at. There are other cases, more complicated cases, and so on and so forth. These are the two simplest cases. These are the two cases we focus on in Chapter 8. Do they occur in the real world? Yeah. They're, they're out there. Um, let's take one at a time. Let's take the constant surface heat flux. Constant surface heat flux, this is a tube carrying water, for instance. I take a little electric heating sheet. You can buy them. They have little resistance wires in them, back and forth, like your toaster inside. Plus and minus, plug it into the wall. The thing heats up. It puts out so many watts per square inch, square centimeter. I take this little blanket, I wrap it around the tube, and now I've got constant surface heat flux. That's one way, okay. It's not quite the same, but in a boiler, you have these tubes carrying water, and they're vertical on the walls, and the wall's adiabatic, it's insulated, and the tubes go up the wall, hundreds of tubes. 
there's a big flame out here. You're burning natural gas. That natural gas provides a flame. Uh, it's radiation and, and part convection, but it's so many watts per square meter. Well, that radiation hits those tubes, but just the front side in a case like that. So it's a modification of that. But that's how you get constant surface heat flux. You know, you've got a solar collector, a parabolic trough, and the idea is here comes a solar radiation. It hits here, and it hits here, and it hits here. Well, look at that. You're approaching this. You're approaching that. So yeah, it does occur in the real world. Okay, so this guy over here. Where does this one occur? Well, this is in, this is in the condenser of the power plant. This was the boiler I told you, partially mo uh, modeled that way. But now this is a condenser. You've got tubes in the condenser. This is Redondo Beach power plant carrying Pacific Ocean cold water in these tubes. And then into this condenser comes the exhaust steam from the turbine. And that steam, hot steam, sees the cold tubes. It condenses on the cold tubes. At, at what temperature? The saturation temperature at the pressure in the condenser. OK. Every drop of steam that condenses, no matter where it condenses on that tube, condenses at what, at what temperature? the saturation temperature at the pressure in the condenser. Right. Every one of these drops has the same temperature, so that's a good approximation for our TS equal constant. So that's just two examples of how these guys work, okay. All right, back to here. Um, we want to ask the question first, how much energy crosses that line? So at location X, how much energy crosses that line? OK, so to do that, we're going to go back to thermo. And uh, that's equal to the integral over the cross-sectional area of the tube, rho u c sub p t d a. Here's where it came from. We know from thermo that energy being transported is m dot c sub p t. The c sub p sometimes stands for the enthalpy, c sub p t. What's the mass flow rate? The mass flow rate is rho a v. What's the velocity? U. There's the density, rho. Where's the area? There it is, dA. So this guy, this guy, and this guy all are m dot, rho a v. That's the energy crossing the dashed line. All right, um, we define this as m dot c sub p t mean. This defines t mean. So this equation defines T mean. So if you want to find the mean temperature of the fluid, what you do is you solve this guy, T mean, So if somebody says, what's the mean fluid temperature? That's the official integral way of finding the mean fluid temperature. But you've got to know how T varies with R. You've got to know how U varies with R. It's not easy. Both U and T vary with R. And what's DA? DA is 2 pi R dr, the little donut-shaped area. 2 pi r dr is the differential area dA. OK, so we did that in ME311 for uh, u, u, the uh, average velocity, the mean velocity in a tube. It's very similar. 
Okay. Um, this TM, why is TM important? Well, this TM is used in our Q, H, A, T, S, minus T, M. So that's Newton's Law of Cooling, Chapter 1, for a tube. Chapter 1. What's the right temperatures to use? The surface temperature, uh, the surface temperature over here, or over here, doesn't matter. The surface temperature minus the mean fluid temperature. Okay. Now, to see how that temperature varies, we take a little differential control volume. The distance is dx. Take a little differential control volume and run an energy balance on the little differential control volume. For this guy, what does the energy balance says? Energy balance says all the energy that comes into the fluid goes into raising its temperature. Okay. What energy comes into the fluid? Oh, there's a, there's a constant surface heat source. There it is right there. That's what comes in Qs double prime. That comes in multiplied by the area. Okay. And what does it, what does it do? It goes into raising the temperature of the fluid. Okay. So that's our m dot c sub p dtm. All the energy that comes from the heat source goes into raising the temperature of the fluid. Okay. What's dA? All right, dA, don't forget, this is the dA is that lined area. It's a circle. Perimeter, pi times d. Perimeter times dx. Perimeter times dx. So dA is P dx. Separate the variables d, t, m, dx, dx. So this is Qs double prime times the perimeter divided by m dot c sub p. The right-hand side is a constant, okay? So integrate this guy to get Tm as a function of x. And use the boundary condition when x equals zero. T mean equal T mean i. Notice that that looks like a linear variation. So if I want to plot that, here's zero, here's x, and I'll just say this is the length of the plate L, and this is the temperature of the fluid, T mean. It comes in at T mean n. It's linear with x, it's a straight line. So here's T mean as a function of X. Now, we're not going to prove this now, but I'll just show you where the surface temperature um, goes. If this is X fully developed for temperature, then the um, surface temperature looks like this.
and the distance between these are the these two lines have the same slope. They have the same slope. Okay. But we're interested in the in the fluid temperature. So there's no equation for TS. You won't have an equation for TS. Just I'm just showing you graphically what it what happens. Okay, now I think that's well, yeah, okay, let's get let's get Q. How do we find Q? Okay, Q. Uh, the heat transfer to the fluid. M dot C sub P T M out minus T M in. So, for the constant wall surface heat flux, we have two important equations. One gives you the temperature at any x value for that tube. The other equation gives you how much heat has been transferred to the fluid. Okay. Now, second case. Ts equal a constant. Okay, we um, can do it somewhat the same way. Here's our little differential fluid element. The distance is dx. We run an energy balance on that little fluid element. Okay, here, right here. What comes into the fluid? Okay. It's not a constant surface heat flux. It's now a constant surface temperature. So it's convection. So what comes in is convection, H, okay, times a differential area, times T S minus T mean. Differential area is perimeter times dx. This is convection in. And what does that energy do? It goes into increasing the temperature of the fluid, which is what? M dot C sub P DT or TM. DTM. And now what you can do is you change variables because that's TM and that's TS minus TM. So you uh, change variables and you go ahead and solve this guy. It's going to be, you're going to have DTM DX. You're going to solve that, okay? And you end up getting this equation. You want to get these two guys to be the same, so you let TS minus TM equal delta T. So that's a delta T there. I'll show you. H, P, delta T, DX equal minus M dot C sub P 
d delta t. d t m equal d delta t. Take the differential of both sides. Don't forget that the surface temperature is constant. The differential is zero. Minus d t m equal d delta t. You want to separate these guys? d delta t over delta t is equal to minus sign h p over m dot c sub p dx. That's all the gory details. Go ahead and integrate both sides. Integrate dx over x. What do you get? Natural log. Take the inverse of natural log. What do you get? Exponential function. There's where it came from. Okay. What do we do? All we did was change the variable to make the differential equation look neater and cleaner. There. Okay. Now, let's uh, look at that, all right? Now, um, we're going to get um, Q, our Q. Uh, let's draw the graph first of all. This is uh, the mean temperature of the fluid. This is X. The tube is L long. There's L. Here's zero. The stuff comes in at T mean in. The tube surface is kept constant at TS. It's kept constant. The fluid temperature increases exponentially. Exponential increase. Don't forget, constant tube, tube heat flux, linear variation of temperature. This one, exponential. Here's the surface temperature of the tube. The stuff that comes in is cold, for instance. It heats up. If it's long enough, if the tube's long enough, eventually the fluid in the tube will get to the same temperature as the tube surface. If it's not that long, stop right here. It comes out at that temperature. That's T mean out. There's T mean out. Over here, here's T mean out. Okay. Pretty, pretty different. I mean, one is linear, other one's exponential. This is like the tube surface temperature is constant. This is like, I said, a condenser. Do you have to worry about anything too much here? No, the hottest the fluid can get is the tube surface temperature. The hottest the fluid can get is the tube surface temperature. Over here, oh, you better be careful. This could be a boiler. And maybe there'd be a tremendous boiler explosion because something bad happened. What, what can be bad? Well, maybe you're changing as this increases. Maybe you reach a point where the liquid water suddenly vaporizes and turns into superheated steam and gets so hot you have a boiler rupture, explosion. And also maybe the tube surface gets so hot the material fails, tube rupture. Because these guys, I'll tell you, these guys never do stop. They don't approach anything asymptotically. They don't stop. Okay, you better be aware then. This guy could be danger. But of course, you do want to, in, in, a, in a boiler, you do want to get superheated, you know. So it's, it's good to a point, but you gotta be careful. That tube surface temperature gets too hot and things could fail, the tube could, could break open, rupture. Okay, so again, different, different things going on here. Um, now, let's take a look at how we uh, get Q over here. Q equal, um, H, 
A delta T, T S minus T, uh, uh, T mean. T surface is hot, T means cold, okay. If I want to get my little DQ right here, okay. DQ in that little differential area is equal to H T S minus T M times my differential area and my differential area there is uh, circumference pi d times the length x, so dA is pi dx. Do you think this guy, when I integrate both sides now, you think I can pull him outside the integral sign? Uh-uh. Over here in the fully developed region, could I pull out the T S minus T mean fluid? Yeah, because that is the same no matter what X you're at, that is the same amount, T S minus T M. It can come outside the integral sign. Here it can't do it. Can't do it. So what do you have to do? See that T S right there? Minus T M. See that T S minus T M? Yeah, that's what you gotta do. You put this guy into here, and you carry it out all the gory details of integration. And when you integrate the exponential function, natural log, natural log. So what comes out is going to be a natural log. Here's what it amounts to. Q equal h bar, the average h, surface area of the tube, as times delta t with a subscript lowercase lm, where delta t lowercase lm equal this. Delta t out minus delta t in divided by, nat there's a natural log now, when you integrate it, natural log delta t out over delta t in. That is called the logarithmic mean temperature difference, or just the log mean temperature difference. It comes out of the integration. Okay, so it came from. And where do you put it? You put it down here in the equation to get Q. What's delta T? The O stands for outlet. The I stands for inlet. What's delta T inlet? Okay, it's right here. That's delta T inlet. And where's outlet? That's from here to here. That's delta T outlet. There's how you find those two guys. All this stuff leads into heat exchanger analysis too. It's like a heat exchanger obviously a boiler, a condenser. Okay, it's more complicated than this guy, constant surface, a heat flux. There's this guy, m dot c sub p delta t. Of course, if you want to, you could also say q equal m dot c sub p t mean out minus t mean in. Because that equation works for all these guys. It's here, it's here. Thermo, m dot delta H enthalpy, m dot C sub P delta T. So now we've got th three main box equations. Let's look at them. For constant surface heat flux, how do you find the temperature anywhere along the tube? Here it is. How do you find the heat transfer that's occurred or the heat added to the liquid, the fluid? Here it is. Constant tube surface temperature. How do you find the, uh, the, the temperature any, at any x value? Here it is. How do you find the heat transfer? Either this equation or this equation. Over here, 
I'm going to find the temperature at the end of the tube, x equal L, and the heat transfer from 0 to L. Do I need to know the convection coefficient? Look for H. No. Look for H. No. I don't need H. Constant tube surface temperature. I want to find the temperature at the end of the tube. Look for H. Oh, yeah. The heat transfer. Look for H. Oh, yeah. You get the difference. You get the difference. You've got to find the H to find this temperature here. You don't need H to find Q because you've got a choice. Okay. So just be aware of that. We're going to find H's no matter what. We'll find H for both cases next time. But for right now, just so you know, you don't need H for this guy to find Q and T. Over here, you do need H to find this guy for the, um, for the temperature. Okay. Now, we're, um, I'm going to go over homework. So we're going to pick this up next time, uh, and we're going to find the H's next time. So this is pretty much where we are in Chapter 8 right now. Okay, so let's shift gears and go to homework. If you came in late and didn't pick up your homework, it's up here in front. Okay, we turned homework in today too. Chap uh, set number 12. All right, um, just so you uh, know, let's see, I guess I looked at, I, I graded 612. Let me see what I've got here. Yeah, 612. They um, gave a picture. No. Okay. Yeah. Let me just read it again here. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. All right, um, they gave a temperature profile. So let's look at 612. All right, this is a flat plate, yeah. Flat plate flow like this. And uh, we have the approaching fluid stream and we have 30 degrees. Okay. T, oh, T, S, T infinity is 30, T, S is 90. So T, S is 90. T infinity is 30. Okay, he tells us that um, the temperature in the uh, boundary layer T is 20 plus 70. E to the minus 600 XY. Okay, so temperature is a function of x and y. We're measuring x from here. We're measuring y from here. Okay, I think that's okay. I'll just read it. It says, obstacles are placed in the flow which intensifies the mexine with increased distance x from the leading edge. Somehow he's put something on that plate which causes more mixing. I don't know what they are. Little bumps on there or something. So the further down you go, the more mixing occurs. So he's artificially done something to the surface. Okay. Determine and plot the manner in which the local convection coefficient H varies with X. Then evaluate the average coefficient over the whole plate. Okay. So uh, find HX. Now, you can go through all that again if you want, but the equation in the textbook, I'll uh, look at here, equation 6, 5, he says that uh, hx equal 
minus k partial t with respect to y at y equals 0 divided by t my, t s minus t infinity. Yeah. Okay, that's part A, then I'm going to have to find this guy. So that, there's this guy. Uh, partial of t with respect to y, constant, 0, 70 minus 600 times x times 70. e to the minus 600 xy. Now do what it says. Partial t with respect to y at y equals 0. 600 times 70 times x times e to the minus 600 xy. But he said, this says where y equals 0. y equals 0. e to the 0 is 1. So dt dy at y equals 0 is equal to 42 times then three zeros times x. Okay, what I'm saying is don't get sloppy in your math. They come back and bite you. I saw a lot of people that said dt dy is 42,000 x. Oh, no, it's not. dt dy is this whole long thing. This thing says, once you get dt dy, but get dt dy first. Then, once you've done that, then you put y equal to zero. You can take shortcuts, but you better be careful because dt dy is not 42,000 x. Okay, now I plot it. Uh, hx versus x, zero. Uh, here it is right here. We start x equals zero, it's zero. Oh, and, and by the way, where'd that minus sign go? Well, you know, I didn't do it right. Now it's right, okay. Minus times minus, it's plus. There it is. Uh, now he says, uh, I, this plate is five meters long. So, uh, 42,000 times uh, five. Let's see what we got here. Five meters long? Yeah. Okay, H bar. The easy way to do it, that's why I had, a, that's why I had you plot it. Once you plot this guy, once you plot this guy, um, then here's five meters. Where's the average value? At two and a half. If you want to do it the harder way, <laughs> Then you have h bar equal 1 over L integral 0 to L h x dx. Go ahead and put this guy right here, um, this dt dy times k, okay? Put this h x in here. This guy goes up here, by the way. Okay, put that h x in here and integrate it. You can do that. You get the right answer. But what I'm just saying is because you know it's linear, linear with x, this is an x up here, it's linear with x that just take, the, just take the middle value. Make life easy for yourself on a timed exam situation. Don't integrate. If you don't have to, that wastes time and increases the chance for a mistake. Okay, but it only works if it's a linear function. Okay, so just a little long story, but that's what I was looking for in that problem. All right, we'll stop for a day, then pick it up on Wednesday.